Thanks for joining. This is part of our lecture series covering the curriculum for novice anaesthetists working towards their initial assessment of competency. Um, we're going to be talking about the assessment of a patient's airway in this lecture. And this is IAC CO3. So our learning objectives are um, why the assessment itself is important learning the role um, of different, as different aspects of the assessment, such as history, examination, investigation, and how these tie into the end result. We're going to learn how to actually assess a patient's airway by watching um, a video. And thinking about airway factors that can lead to difficulty with extubation. So sometimes we think of uh, assessment of a patient's airway as really about getting a tube in, but there's much more to it than that. We're going to understand the limitations of an airway assessment. So see that um, the sensitivities and specificities of some of the tests when taken individually or as a whole. We're going to learn what to do when a difficult airway is predicted, how it can be safely signposted and escalated. And we're going to see which of the um, other curriculum content in the Royal, for the Royal College of um, Anaesthetists can be linked to this workplace-based assessment. So when you have an opportunity to uh, participate in this assessment, you can also sign up lots of other curriculum items to maximise your workplace-based assessments. So this is the curriculum content we're going to cover. The main, um, main item is to discuss how the airway was assessed and how difficult intubation can be predicted. And this is part of the Initial Assessment of Competencies, C03. But if you look through the curriculum content for core anaesthetics, you can actually see that there are multiple other areas which can be linked to this, uh, to a well-organised IAC workplace-based assessment. And I've included seven there that um, I have found through scanning through the documentation. So what do I mean by saying other curriculum can be uh, covered or can be associated with this workplace-based assessment? Well, if you go to the lifelong learning platform provided by the Royal College of Anaesthetists, whenever you do a workplace-based assessment, it uh, there are two places where you can tag or attach um, various curriculum items. So the, the lower one that I've got there below the free text box um, is the IAC uh, code. So that would be, in this instance, IAC C05. But also in the arrow pointing above the free text box, you can see that there are other curriculum competencies. And so those would include the seven other items that I mentioned in the previous slide. So if you do this one case-based discussion, you can get eight items associated with it you're going to be going through your curriculum at a much more rapid pace. So on to the actual lecture itself. So why do we assess an airway? Well, it's a core skill for anaesthetist. We are often thought of as airway specialists. The Royal College of Anaesthetists are obviously keen to perpetuate that, and they note its importance by how often this skill is referenced in our curriculum. General anaesthesia itself is associated with loss of airway patency, loss of protective airway reflexes, hyperventilation and apnea. These are all anticipated sequelae of the drugs we give. And so by rendering someone apneic with loss of airway reflexes, it's fundamental for an anaesthetist to be able to secure a patent airway to protect a patient from hypoxic harm. However, it's not just a concern for an elective general anaesthetic. If we provide sedation, that can lead to exactly the same features. Um, and there are num innumerate emergency situations in the emergency department resus um, area, on ITU, inpatient wards associated with low GCS, anaphylaxis, respiratory failure, etc., etc., where the ability to assess and secure an airway are paramount. <laughs> We are, as a specialty, fortunate to have some large-scale clinical audits uh, been performed, which help guide our practice, um, demonstrating that we're a very safety-conscious group. And the National Audit um, Project 4, NAP4, uh, looked into, uh, I suppose, the question that we're really answering today. They found that failure to assess for and identify potential airway difficulty 
or the application of poor judgment in an airway management planning can contribute to a poor outcome. It really highlights just how seriously we should take our assessment of an airway. So the role of an airway assessment really therefore is to identify predicted problems with the maintenance of oxygenation during airway management and to formulate an airway plan in the event of an anticipated difficult airway or in the scenario of emergency airway management. And a good way to think about it is performing a risk assessment. There are no tests that are absolutely 100% um, specific or sensitive. So you are engaging in a risk assessment to look into the various aspects of airway management you're likely to perform and coming up with likelihoods of difficulty being encountered. So what are we assessing our airway we're assessing the airway for? Well, I suppose the main uh, problem is that of a difficult airway. And we often hear is anticipated difficult airway. Well, what does that mean? Well, the American Society of Anesthesiologists defines it as the clinical situation in which a conventionally trained anaesthetist experiences difficulty with mask ventilation, tracheal intubation, or both. The airway assessment gives us a feel for difficulties that may be experienced with, I've, li I've listed five key um, uh, areas. That uh, first one is the patient self-ventilating. The second one is those encountered during bag mask ventilation. Thirdly, problems associated with suprachotic airway insertion. Then tracheal intubation, which is probably what most people immediately go to as difficult airway. And then finally, um, difficulty encountered with infraglottic airway insertion. So all aspects of the airway assessment are designed to ascertain whether one or more of these processes may be difficult. I think it's also wise to perhaps include in this as a sixth point, extubation. So we should be looking to answer, by the time we've done our airway assessment, we should be looking to answer the following questions. Will the patient be able to maintain their own airway? Will I be able to mask ventilate the patient? Will I be able to form laryngoscopy directly or indirectly? Will I be able to insert a supraglottic device? Will I be able to intubate the patient? Is there a significant aspiration risk? If I predict any difficulty, should I secure the, the airway while the patient is awake? At the end of the day, can I access the cricothyroid membrane if I need to? And how will this patient's airway behave at extubation? So the first part of any assessment um, is history. And this is an opportunity to ask the patient um, multiple questions to aid our risk assessment. Initially, you would ask about any difficulties with previous anesthesia or any difficulties that had been communicated to the patient by other clinicians. Knowing about previous anesthetics is an incredibly rich source of information with the caveat that it's very, it's subjective information dependent on the skill of the anaesthetist um, who performed their last general anaesthetic or who managed their airway last, together with thinking about the, t the time that has changed between that last anaesthetic and any differences that may have occurred within the airway over that time. And also, as always, unfortunately, the quality of documentation that um, exists. Then you want to establish the existence of relevant pathophysiological states. And I've included a, not an exhaustive list, list, but I think a representative list of the main things that we certainly want to make sure we covered. So firstly, rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma. Rheumatoid arthritis can affect um, patient positioning. It's a multi-systemic disease that can also cause fibrosis in the lungs, um, therefore difficulty with ventilation can cause atlanto um, axial subluxation. Scleroderma itself is associated with difficulty with mouth opening, associated with difficulty, therefore, with um, laryngeal mask insertion, 
direct laryngoscopy, laryngoscopy and intubation. Is the patient pregnant or are they obese? Uh, pregnancy could cause edema to the airway, the difficulty in positioning the patient, ventilation um, issues, rapid desaturations, reflux disease. The same is true largely of obesity. The existence of burns causing quite significant airway swelling and edema. Along with that, I'd think about facial trauma and if they've had any, um, any facial trauma in, in, in the past. Congenital diseases such as Pierre Robin, Clippelfile and Treacher Collins. These are three key congenital diseases that um, as an anaesthetist we should know about and should ring alarm bells. The existence of any previous head and neck lesions, um, any operations they've had in that area, any masses that still persist. Operations can cause fibrosis and scar tissue to form, making manipulation of the airway positioning very difficult. Clearly, any lesions or masses may cause um, mass effect and anatomical variations, which also make things difficult. Obstructive sleep apnea. It's becoming increasingly prevalent in the UK. It's a big concern for us as anaesthetists. It affects face mask ventilation, positioning, direct laryngoscopy, intubation, emergence, extubation. Then thinking about conditions that might uh, increase secretions, um, risks of bronchospasm, laryngospasm, such as um, asthma, smoking, and then the presence of uh, reflux disease. How frequent is it? Frequent that they experience the symptoms, how it's managed and controlled, and whether ultimately this comes with an associated aspiration risk for us. And we want to know the fasting status of the patient and the quality of the patient's dentition. Next, we come on to the examination part of our airway assessment. And we're focusing purely on the airway examination. The examination of a patient as part of a preoperative assessment is outside of the scope of this lecture, but it is covered in another lecture, um, the IAC um, A01 lecture on preoperative assessment. For our purposes, we want, we want to start with a general look at the face um, and the mouth and the nose. We're looking for any facial deformities. We're looking for the existence of any um, this lesions or any stigmata of those congenital diseases that I mentioned before. Look for the existence of a beard. You want to look at the neck. You want to see if it's short. Uh, see if there's an opposite deformity such as um, marked kyphosis. Then look at their chest. Have they got um, a barrel chest, quite stout? Have they got large breasts? They can make actual physical laryngoscopy difficult. Assess their BMI and look to see if they are obviously pregnant. Next, we want the patient to open their mouth as wide as possible. And here we're looking to measure the inter-incisor gap. Now we should use a ruler and it's normal for them to have an inter-incisor gap of four to six centimeters. Um, However, um, commonly we use the patient's fingers as a surrogate and they should be able to fit two fingers um, in, uh, in between their incisors. So three centimetres is the size of the flange on um, a standard Macintosh laryngoscope and an LMA um, can clear an inter-incisor gap of two centimetres. So that's where those kind of numbers are coming from. Next, we look for the, while their mouth is open, look at the prominence of their incisors. Have they got buck teeth? And then look at their dentition in general. Are there few teeth in there? Are there some wobbly teeth in there? Next, while with their mouth open, get them to stick out their tongue. And here you're looking to do a modified Malum Patti uh, classification. And that's a grade from one to four. And so you're looking um, to see if you can see the uvula the soft and hard palates, the anterior and posterior um, facial pillars. We'll actually go through this score in a bit more detail on the next slide. Um, 
and then ask the patient to protrude their mandible. So uh, here you're looking to see whether they can bring the lower incisors in front of, level with, or only bring it posterior to the upper incisors. And being able to do that would give them a, um, a score of A, B, or C respectively. It's optimal for them to be able to bring their lower incisors anterior to their upper incisors. Then ask them to bite their upper lip. So here you're looking to see um, how much of the upper lip the patient can cover with their lower incisors. So can they bite above the vermilion border? That'll give them a, uh, a score of one. Do they bite below the border but still manage to bite the lip? That's two. And if they can't bite their upper lip at all, that gives them a score of three. It's optimal for them to be able to clear the vermilion border, get a score of one. Then ask, then you want to assess the C-spine movement. So ask them first of all to touch their chin to their chest. It's normal to be able to do that. And then ask them to fully extend, so look up to the, look up to the sky. And they should have a full range of movement of about 90 to 100 degrees. After that, we're going, we look to measure um, thyroid mental joint function. And this is covered, um, sorry, after this, we uh, then look at um, the sub submandibular space by measuring thyroid mental distance. So with the patient still in neck extension, measure the distance from the um, mental prominence to the thyroid cartilage. And it's normal for this to be greater than six and a half centimeters. Keep their head in that position. Then you go from um, the chin all the way to the angle of uh, Louis, and here you're looking, this is otherwise called the Saba test, and that sternomental distance is normal to have a score of, uh, to a distance of greater than 12 and a half centimeters. Then have a feel for the cricothyroid membrane. That would be your emergency front of neck access if you needed to. So just touching back on one of the particular tests, the um, Malampati score, or really what we do nowadays is the modified Malampati score. This is probably the commonest um, anaesthetic test, and uh, most anaesthetists may not actually perform all of the tests I've just mentioned. Obviously, it's best, best practice to do all of them. But as a minimum, I think you'll see everyone will have a look inside the mouth and ask the patient to stick out their tongue and come up with this grading. So it was originally described by Malampati in the 1980s, where only three grades were given and modified subsequently um, by Samsoon and Young to be the score that we now use. You have a patient sat upright. Their head is in a neutral position. Get them to open their mouth as wide as they can and then protrude the tongue. They don't need to speak, make noises during this. And while you're looking in the mouth, you're looking for uh, five, well, actually, you're looking at six, six anatomical structures. You're looking um, at the tongue. You're looking for the anterior and posterior facial pillars. You're looking for the uvula, both the base, the stalk, and the tip. And you're looking for the soft palate and the hard palate. If you you have a you have a score of one if you can see both the anterior and posterior pillars, the hard and soft palates, and the uvula base. That's no, like the uvula tip. A score of two if you can see all of those except for the posterior pillars. You get a score of three if actually you can uh, only see the base of the uvula um, and the hard palate, and you get a score of four if the only thing you can see is the hard palate. So score one to four. There are some clinicians who um, describe malampati score of zero being if you can actually see the epiglottis with the patient with their mouth maximally open. So this is described in the literature, um, but it's not part of the modified malampati score. It is itself not something that's worth mentioning in an exam OSCE viva scenario. <clears throat> The relevance of this score is that the higher the grade, the more difficult direct laryngoscopy is likely to be, associated with less preferable cormac lehane um, uh, direct laryngoscopy views. The higher the grade, the more acute the angle is between the base of the tongue 
and the laryngeal inlet. And that's what causes problems during laryngoscopy. So we've done our examination. We now move on to investigations. And there aren't really too many um, investigations associated with our airway. You may see, uh, you may have access to radiological examinations of the neck in a neutral position and of the head extended. I mean, that would be pretty specialised enough if you were anticipating a difficult airway or as part of an ENT MaxFax um, complex operation workup. You may be in possession of a CT scan showing soft tissues around the neck and you'd be able to identify tracheal deviation or any narrowing. Um, and some people propose that you could use this to create a sort of 3D augmented image um, to facilitate sort of virtual laryngoscopy. I think that's uh, rarely done. The patient may have had nasolaryngoscopy, especially if the, what you're having is an ENT procedure. It would be very useful for you to have um, access to that nasolaryngoscopy um, result. Or, better yet, talk to the ENT surgeon um, so you can ascertain any uh, difficult anatomical problems that might be there. There's work going on um, around facial image analysis and point of care ultrasound. So using um, facial recognition algorithms to analyze uh, face distances, the presence of certain um, anatomical um, factors, and then coming up with a, uh, an airway score as a result of that. A really kind of very high highly sophisticated um, end of bed, if you like, general inspection, and also the use of ultrasound to examine soft tissues in the neck. So that may be something that occurs in the future. It's perhaps something worth knowing about now in terms of this might be something that, that comes our way. But it's very important to stress that these are not mainstream. The efficacy of these modalities has no way been established. So after thinking about um, that, now we've got our, we've done our examinations, we've done our, um, we've taken our history, we've done examination and we've looked at some investigations. We can now think to put this information together as part of our risk assessment um, into whether we think this patient will have uh, a difficult airway, whether this patient will have problems with those five um, events that I mentioned in the previous slide. And it doesn't make sense to take one examination on its own. You really have to bring together multiple bits of information to create a uh, more robust picture. So there are some multivariate scoring systems that exist that take together certain aspects and uh, using conjunction can help you with your risk assessment. Now, it's important to say that since the prevalence of difficult um, of a difficult airway or difficult intubation in the general population is low, for any one test, the positive predictive value will itself also always be low. And that's where these um, multivariate scoring systems come into play. The two main ones that I'm going to mention here, there are many, many more, but for the purposes of an IAC, knowing about these two is worthwhile. Uh, the first is the Wilson score. And this includes five factors, uh, which include the patient's weight, head and neck movement, presence of receding mandible, jaw movement, and the presence of buck teeth. Each of uh, these factors are scored depending on specific value ranges with a maximum score of 10. And if the patient has a threshold score of 4, then um, the threshold score, any score... Um, uh, below that, we would anticipate a uh, difficult airway. The next one is the ARNI risk index. Um, and this was constructed by a group of ENT surgeons. Um, and this includes seven factors, which is a history of difficulty, any pathology, any pathology of the airway, the intra-incisor gap, the mandible luxation, Thyromental distance, maximum range of movement for the head and neck, and the modified Malampati score. Again, each factor 
is given um, a number of points depending on specific value ranges. The maximum score that you can have is 48. And if you score 11 or below, then you would anticipate a difficult airway. We'll come on to the sensitive and specificity of these multivariate scoring systems when we look at those values for the individual tests a bit later. So now we're going to see a demonstration of an airway assessment. It doesn't include the history um, and doesn't include investigations, but it can show you how you can do a thorough airway assessment. So now we're going to do an airway assessment and we have Chris helping us with the demonstration. Um, so at first I'm going to have a look at the uh, face and neck and check whether the patient has a beard or any abnormalities that might make uh, intubation or ventilation difficult. Uh, then I'm going to ask you to open your mouth, please, as much as you can, and try to fit fingers. Yeah, so Chris can clearly fit three fingers inside the mouth. And whilst the mouth is open, uh, I'm going to have a look at the inside of the and uh, check the dentition. And at the same time, uh, to a uh, patty check. Uh, can you please open your mouth and protrude your tongue? So clearly, Chris is a great one. I can see the uvula, uh, the pillars, and the soft pillars as well. Uh, thank you, Chris. Can you please uh, protrude your mandible for us? Yeah. And can you bite your upper lip? That's very good. And now we're going to check the uh, neck movements. Um, can you please flex your neck? Okay. And then can you extend your neck as much as you can? Do you have any pain with your neck? Okay. And while uh, Chris is in uh, extension, I'm going to check the um, tidal mental distance and the uh, sternal mental distance as well. And finally, I'm going to uh, examine the creeper tidal count. Thank you. So let's look at the first. So let's look at the first airway intervention that we may look to perform, that's bag mask ventilation. So I've included here classification of um, difficulty or grades um, of difficulty for bag mask ventilation. And I have to, from the um, outset, I have to say it's a highly subjective grading. It's very dependent on operator skill. Um, but the end result of this is that we are unable to maintain saturations greater than 90%. This is reflected by us being unable to uh, create an adequate mask seal with excessive gas leak and excessive resistance to inspiratory or expiratory airflow. Grade one is where actually we can ventilate the person, the, the patient um, with a mask. And thankfully, 77% of the population fall into this category. They would be easy back mass ventilation. Grade two is where we need to employ the use of an, ad, uh, of an airway um, adjunct with or without muscle relaxation. So still pretty straightforward for a single operator to perform. Um, and a further 21% of patients fall into this category. Then we come to grade three, which is where it's difficult to mask ventilate despite an uh, airway adjunct or muscle relaxation, and you require two providers to ventilate the patient. So this would classically be a two-handed technique on the face mask while someone else is manipulating the bag to provide um, airway pressure. Needing to resort to this to maintain saturation is greater than 90 occurs in 1.4% of patients. And finally, grade four, which is the most serious, is that you are unable to mask ventilate the patient with or without the use of muscle relaxants, with or without an extra operator. This happens very rarely. 0.16% of patients. The next area intervention that we might consider is um, supraglottic device insertion. So supraglottic devices are our LMAs, um, eye gels, pro seals, 
and all those sorts of devices. <clears throat> the prevalence of having difficulty inserting a device is of the order of 0.2 to 1%, so it's very small. And there are a number of factors that are associated with difficulty with supraglottic device insertion that will have come out from our airway assessment. And there's a mnemonic for this, which is RODS. It's devised by Murphy and Walls. And Murphy and Walls have actually done a lot of work, which is going to come up in the next few slides, looking into these multivariate um, mnemonic systems um, for predicting difficulty. And the mnemonic RODS stands for R, reduced mouth opening. So a small mouth opening um, will limit the ease of placement of a laryngeal mask airway. But um, an LMA can, remember, can be inserted with an intra-incisor gas of a gap of two centimetres. The O stands for obstruction. So any airway obstruction at or below the level of the glottis will not be relieved by the insertion of a supraglottic device, clearly. Therefore, if there is obstruction at or below the glottis, there will still be obstruction even when you've put this in. The D stands for distorted airway. So any unusual airway anatomy may prevent the supraglottic device from sealing or seating properly and you'll get compromised seal. Regardless of whether you go up or down a size, um, or you may have to go to uh, different types of supraglottic device to get a better seal. And then the S stands for stiff neck or lungs. So in a situation of decreased lung compliance, for example in asthma, ventilation can be very difficult because you require very high pressures. And supraglottic devices are, if you like, tested to a working pressure that varies, but once you go above 25 to 30, you lose the, you tend to lose the seal. And your lower esophageal sphincter, because failure pressure is about 20 centimeters of water. So you then run the risk of uh, not having a defensive airway and overcoming your lower esophageal sphincter and regurgitation. And then stiff neck, we have to be aware of a patient with limited neck movement because this may inhibit the ability of a supraglottic device to form a good seal. Many of the supraglottic devices are preformed, therefore they require the patient to be able to um, place their airway in that preformed state. If you have reduced movement, you are not going to follow the um, easy core, the easy curvature of, for example, an eye gel. The next intervention that we might look to do is endotracheal intubation. And um, again, Murphy and Walls have come up with a mnemonic for this as well. And this has been sort of validated in various studies. It's used mostly as a predictor in, um, or it's designed for um, as an assistant to emergency department practitioners to predict difficult um, airway. And the mnemonic is lemon. So the first one is to look externally, are there any obvious deformities, evaluate mouth opening of less than five centimeters or thyromental distance of less than six, look at the patient's malampati class, a higher class, it's associated with more difficult endotracheal intubation. Look for the presence of obstruction, so strider, and then neck mobility. Now, um, I would say that endotracheal intubation, um, where we look at mouth opening of less than five centimeters, you actually need three centimeter incentivizer gap to insert the flange of a Macintosh blade. The rest of, uh, so being out, that'll be physically being able to put it into the um, oropharynx. Being able to view down to the glottic opening requires neck movement. Difficult intubation has a prevalence of about one to two percent uh, of the normal surgical population. And remember I've said difficult intubation, which is not the same as failed intubation. And a difficult endotracheal intubation can be defined as um, needing more than three attempts or failure at your best attempt or requiring more than 10 minutes of uh, attempts to secure the airway.
So what it is what so what is what is it about a patient's airway that can make direct laryngoscopy difficult? So there's a theory about this. I'm going to go into the um, sort of three axes theory. There is another theory which is all the two curves theory, which would be worth looking into. But this is sort of the oldest and perhaps the uh, the commonest theory that's existing at the moment. So one that's worth worth talking about uh, for the purposes of the IAC anyway. Um, you know, the purpose of direct laryngoscopy is to visualise the glottic opening and to um, facilitate intubation of the trachea. It is, as the name suggests, performed by direct vision. And the theory goes that in order to visualise the epiglottis, you need three axes to be aligned. And the ability of the patient to achieve this position um, is actually the basis of the majority of our airway assessment and examination that we've gone into. So the three axes are the oral axis, which you can see as a dashed vertical line, which follows the path of the patient's tongue and really actually follows the line of um, patient's, uh, patient's teeth. The pharyngeal axis, which follows the path of the oropharynx and the laryngeal axis, which is a line that uh, transects the laryngeal um, inlet. Now, are, in order for these three axes to be aligned, you need to put the patient into a position called sniffing the morning air. So, the first thing that you look to do is when you have your patient, if you imagine your patient is lying down with the head on the bed, is to raise the head. Raising the head causes flexion of the neck at the chest, which you'd assess with your chin to chest, and that aligns your pharyngeal and laryngeal axes. The next um, manipulation you do is to extend the head um, of the neck. And this then aligns the oral axes with those two, the pharyngeal and laryngeal axes. If you can get the patient into that position, then you give yourself the, yourself the, the straightest line, the optimum line of sight into the, um, into the glottic opening. And so the best chance of intubation under direct laryngoscopy. Now, importantly, this is just to facilitate a line of sight, if you like. The ability to actually insert the blade in the first place requires mouth opening. Um, uh, temporomandibular joint function. You know, it requires uh, good um, submandibular spaces as well. So much more goes into it in terms of intubation. But the direct laryngoscopy theory really covers getting the patient into the sniffing the morning air position. So what are some of the predictive factors that go into either difficult bag mask ventilation, um, difficult laryngoscopy, difficult infraglottic air insertion, etc.? Well, Difficult bag mask ventilation can be predicted by patients being over the age of 55. If they are um, overweight, so BMI greater than 26, especially if it's trunkly distributed. If they don't have any teeth, got a beard. Um, if there's a history of snoring or OSA. And if they have a modified Mallon patty score of three or four. And if there's limited mandibular protrusion. So I put this as a B or a C. So this is just bringing your, your teeth forward. And I would also add that perhaps a two or a three on your upper lip bite test would be appropriate here. In terms of direct laryngoscopy, predictive factors include a history of difficult intubation, mouth opening less than two finger breaths, the presence of cervical collars, so if the patient's coming in a trauma call, neck extension less than 80, neck circumference greater than 43 centimetres, the existence of any cancerous growths, large tongue, um, 
limited mandibular protrusion, so BLC, or again, um, upper lip bite test uh, two or three. Melon patty score of three or four, a high arched palate, buck teeth, a sternal mental distance of less than 12 and a half, or a thyro mental distance of less than seven centimeters. Difficult infraglottic airway insertion, and we come back to Murphy and Walls again, um, can be predicted with the using this um, the mnemonic short. The S standing for surgery on the neck, the H standing for any hematoma or infection present in the airway, the O for obesity, the R standing for any um, radiation therapy to the neck, and the T for the existence of a tumour. So we know how to do our examination now. We know which parts are important in our history and investigations. We've got an idea as to how that information can be used to predict which of the five um, airway interventions we might look to perform may be predicted as being difficult. So actually how good are those individual tests, those individual examinations that we do in terms of sensitivity and specificity? So I've included a table here um, that I've taken from various sources and Cochrane studies. And there is a huge range of sensitivity and specificity and positive predictive value because there are, there are multiple studies that have looked into these. And I've included the sort of six most, you know, I suppose the six commonest tests to look at in terms of assessing sensitivity and specificity. So the first one's a modified Malin Patti score, which has a sensitivity of quite a large range, um, but at its best, 81% um, sensitive and 82% specific. At its worst, 65% sensitive, 66% specific, which gives us a positive predictive value of 8 to 9%. That is not a good test. The next one is our thorough mental distance. Now that is slightly better than a modified Malambati, but I would argue it is less frequently performed. And this has a sensitivity of 65 to 91% with a specificity of 81 to 82% with a better positive predictive value. Then looking at mouth opening is incredibly specific, but not at all sensitive. The positive predictive value therefore has got a much wider range of 7 to 25%. And jaw protrusion um, is the least sensitive of all, but is again quite highly specific, again giving it a very wide positive predictive value range. And then looking at our multivariate scores, the Wilson score itself, and remember the Wilson score does not include the modified Malapati, um, has a sensitivity of only 42 to 55 percent, with a specificity of 86 to 92. So Actually, just doing a modified Malin Patti test seems to be a more sensitive, specific, and uh, equal positive predictive value test to doing an entire set of five um, examinations. And then the Arnie Risk Index, which uh, comes out the best out of all of these um, all of these tests, with a sensitivity greater than eighty and a specificity greater than ninety which gives us a positive predictive value of greater than 25%. So you can see that there's quite a big range. Certainly among the individual tests, none of them are particularly sensitive. You do need to perform multiple um, tests or, a, a, or an, a, an aggregate of them to get a good risk assessment. So we've covered the aspects of Securing an airway, uh, something that I did mention um, at the very beginning of the lecture was thinking that actually extubation should be considered as an aspect of airway management and therefore we should be thinking in our assessment as um, how the, the patient's airway is going to behave during extubation. And in fact, the Difficult Airway Society has highlighted, highlighted that extubation is a vitally important stage in patient management. And we know from our AAGBI guidance, 
from various uh, national audit projects that the recovery stage or the immediate stage post intubation is an incredibly dangerous time for a patient. And airway obstruction is the most common cause for early postoperative reintubation. Thinking about the difficulties that you might therefore experience on extubation, or thinking about factors that may increase the risk of problems after extubation, you can break it down into think about uh, any trauma that you induced by attempts to secure the airway initially. The presence of any airway edema, which may have occurred as a result of trauma or uh, steep head down positioning, generous fluids, pregnancy. Um, any residual effect of general anaesthetic drugs that have obtunded airway reflexes, decreased respiratory function, presence of opiates, um, inadequately reverse neuromuscular blockade, um, or any airway, um, any local anaesthesia that may. Um, have affected the airway. Along with that, thinking about patients as they recover from anaesthesia are more drowsy, they're less awake. Therefore, patients who in their normal day-to-day -day experience airway problems during times of reduced consciousness, such as OSA, these are patients that you can they anticipate a difficulty in extubation and the need for um, vigilance and airway support. So we've done all the work, we've identified, um, or we've created a, uh, a risk analysis on, of the uh, patient's airway. Now we need to document it. If we didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So it's good practice to get into the habit of recording, I think, 10 parameters, certainly as a novice, because then you get into the habit of doing the tests and you get into the habit of seeing the patterns that emerge as a result. And these factors I've put down as previous history of any um, anaesthetic issues, including difficult intubation. And if someone has been kind enough to mention difficult face mask ventilation, all the better. Presence of gastroesophageal reflux, presence of obstructive sleep apnea, and their BMI. Those are four things that can be um, identified from the history and um, yeah, the history alone. Next. I've um, got mouth opening and intraincisor gap, the modified Malin Patty score, examination of the teeth, the upper lip bite test, and, or mandible protrusion test, do one or other, and thorough mental distance, cervical spine movement. I would say that would be the minimum that you'd want to write down as, um, to document your airway assessment. So now you've left the patient. You've documented in the notes, and maybe you've identified a patient who you think is at risk of a difficult airway. So what do you do now? Well, as a novice, you're never going to be anaesthetizing a patient on your own, and you should feel empowered to ask anybody for assistance in making um, good, robust plans for patients that you see. So the key aspect of um, or the aspect of um, difficult airway management is communication to the wider team, not just your immediate anaesthetic team, which could be the senior consultant that you're working with in the ODP, also to the theatre team, because the theatre team need to be aware that there could be a difficult there could be difficulty with the airway. This enables you to have actually more people around, and to allow people to appreciate that you may be taking a little bit more time with this patient in preparation. More people aware means more people can go and help to set up um, and get the necessary equipment for managing a difficult airway. You may also, if you're on an ENT list, want to make sure that your ENT surgeon is present and scrubbed. The key objective for any airway management plan is to maintain oxygenation and to minimize airway trauma. So there are multiple techniques that you may need to adopt 
to avoid hypoxia and provide a high success rate with minimum attempts. This is going to depend very much on the uh, on your experience and skill, on the experience and skill of the uh, senior anaesthetist you're working with, the specialities available in the hospital you work at, and the equipment available in the department you're in. So it doesn't really make sense to be uh, too prescriptive about this stage, about this part of um, uh, of communicating difficult airway or coming up with plans, because it's so patient and department specific. I just want to get across to you that communication and involving senior people is paramount when you have a patient with a difficult airway. Because remember, at the very beginning of this, we talked about what um, general anaesthesia or sedation can do to a patient, which ultimately is to obtund reflexes, cause obstruction, reduce respiratory function, induce apnea, and therefore put the patient at risk of hypoxia. And we should all be very worried about causing hypoxia, and therefore we should all be very keen to um, spread that risk and share that load and involve senior members of the team. If you do end up um, encountering a difficult airway, then you've got a duty to talk to the patient about it and communicate it to them, not immediately post-op, when they've had a chance to recover from the anaesthetic, when they're lucid. And the Difficult Airway Society has got an airway alert form and you can register the patient on that website to keep a sort of central uh, list of such patients. It can be incredibly empowering for the next anaesthetist who meets that patient when they say, have you had any previous problems with any anaesthetic? For the patient to say to them, yes, I was told I was a difficult intubation. And this, these are the precautions that they took and ultimately this is how they, they, how they managed to intubate me. Would be incredibly useful information for um, the next anaesthetist. So I hope it's been useful. This so to recap, um, we've discussed the importance of a thorough airway assessment. We've looked at the roles of the history examination and investigations. We've looked at how to actually assess a patient's airway. The limitations of the assessments we perform, what to do when a difficult airway is predicted and the importance of signposting a difficult airway for future clinicians. And we've also looked at some other curriculum items that you would be um, advised to link to this workplace-based assessment to maximise um, your time. I hope it's been a useful uh, lecture. It is designed for novice anaesthetists. It is not designed as learning for passing the primary. Um, and it's designed to assist you with the case-based discussion that you're ultimately going to have as part of your IAC. As anaesthetic novices, um, just remember that the development of specific airway management plans depends on the patient in front of you, depends on the consultant you're working with, and depends on the equipment in your hospital. Okay, So hopefully this lecture provides you a good grounding and explanation for why we perform an airway assessment. I've included some references uh, and further reading at the end, um, the final slides, which I'll um, go to in a moment. So thank you very much for listening. Um, please complete a short survey monkey survey that we've included uh, a, a link to at the bottom of this video. It will really help us to improve our content. Um, thank you very much.